Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Encouraging you to live as an ambassador of God's kingdom in the world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Time to rise and shine. Let's go be shiny today. Uh, I'm Carmen LeBurge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen here on the Faith Radio Network. What do you need uh, encouragement in today? I'd like to be a, I'd like to come alongside you and be a person of encouragement as you, yeah, as you get out there into the world that God so loves. We want to do so in ways that honor Jesus. So, hey, you know, of all the things you're going to do today, of all the things you're going to do today, maybe you could just not embarrass Jesus. Like that, that's, that's sort of what I'm going for. I'm going for living a life that is lived to the glory of God and just doesn't embarrass Jesus. So <clears throat> maybe, maybe that would be a good Christian, <laughs> Christian witness today. So you and I are going to spend a few minutes here um, together bringing the mind of Christ to bear on some of the headlines of the day. A couple of headlines got me thinking about the way we use words and how saturated our culture is when it comes to spiritual language. And so as you're going to get God back into the conversations of the day, here are, you know, here are some things you might use. The New York Times is reporting that the comet Pons Brooks, did you even know that there was a comet Pons Brooks out there? I, I did not, but there you go. There's a comet out there, Pons Brooks, and it is apparently having its last hurrah. Well, not its last, last hurrah, but it's Last hurrah for maybe, I don't know, another 70 years, something like that. So it says, um, here's the, the headline. This devil-horned comet won't be visible for another seven decades. So it's not that it's having its last hurrah. It's that those who are living now are likely not to be here the next time it has another hurrah. Um, and I do think this is a good reminder that there are times, and I'm using here the fact that they refer to it as a devil-horned comet. When I talk about finding spiritual language out there and reconnecting the eternal with the everyday, so you know you see a headline and it's got the devil literally in it. Hey, that's a good opportunity for you to get God back into the conversation as well. And here's the thing: even though um, this comet is not going to be visible to us for an, uh, you know some seven decades. It's not like it's actually going anywhere. Same true of the devil, right? Just because you don't see him operating um, in uh, in your purview right now doesn't mean he's actually gone anywhere. You may not see the devil horns or the devil's horns, but he's still prowling around, as Peter warns us, looking for a way into our life to kill and steal and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life. And have it to the full, have it abundantly. Um, The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. And he does so in ways that are sneaky, even even robed in light. This is a comet, after all, we're talking about. So there you go. There's one way to get God into a conversation today. You can talk about the comet Pons Brooks having its, quote, last hurrah. You know, and you could just say, it's super interesting that they, they would... They would call it a devil-horned comet. I don't even know exactly what that means, but hey, if I hear somebody talking about the devil, then I immediately want to be talking about the spiritual reality of God. You could get God back into that conversation today, couldn't you? I bet you can. I know you can. I'm counting on you. The Washington Post is reporting that hikers keep climbing Hawaii's, quote, stairway to heaven, and so, well, now they're tearing it down. Okay, so first of all, I don't think it's very hard to get God back into a conversation about a stairway to heaven, nor um, the fact that uh, people don't want other people climbing it, and so they're tearing it down. (laughs) Just think about that for a moment. Um, The stairway to heaven is being torn down, and it's been blocked off now for years and years, and they've like 
posted guards so that people wouldn't climb the stairway to heaven. And people were so desperate to climb the stairway to heaven that they were sneaking around the guards and um, and trespassing across private property to climb these 3,922 stairs that that weave up a steep mountainside? Why? Because they were hoping to catch a sunrise from the ridge. People are striving so hard to find some way to get to heaven. A lot of thoughts about how you could get God back into this conversation. Um, you could use this. You could use this headline about, you know, the state of Hawaii now tearing down the quote-unquote highway to heaven because people have been trespassing. <laughs> First of all, just think about that for a moment. There's no trespassing on the bridge that God has created. His name is Jesus, and he welcomes you. There's no barriers to entry, and nobody can ever tear it down. Here on earth, yeah, whatever you build, whatever you build today, somebody's going to tear it down. Pretty much, uh, in all likelihood, it's going to be dismantled. Not all promises of of getting to heaven actually deliver. Those quote-unquote stairways to heaven that people have constructed, I mean, you know, let's go all the way back to the Tower of Babel if you want to have a conversation about people imagining that they could build for themselves a way to God. Um, anybody who tells you that you have to climb or that the military has to build a stairway to heaven, they have missed the entire reality of the grace that's demonstrated and offered by God through the person and work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. There is nothing you have to do. The whole thing is a gift. Jesus is the one who makes the way. You just get on his back because he alone can carry you to heaven. That's the message of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where, you know, Paul says, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, not by climbing some stairway. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not designed to be something that you can boast in. It's a gift. So, do you long to see the sunrise? Do you want to ascend to the very top of the proverbial mountain? Do you want to go to heaven? What's your plan for getting there? There is a way. And his name is Jesus. That's how you get God back into the conversations of the day, using the headlines and bringing the mind of Christ to bear. Let's continue our conversations um, here in just a moment. Maybe you've got a headline or a story, something that's happening in the world, and you're like, I'd like some help bringing God back into this conversation. You could text me, 877-933-2484. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Several things are happening uh, today all at once. Um, God is God is not lacking in his ability or his compassion, his interest. And so what has your attention today? I'd like to be praying with you um, on that front. You can text me, 877-933-2484. I'm Carmen LeBurge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen on the Faith Radio Network. If you've just joined us for the very first time. Welcome. We'd like to send you a welcome pack. You can text the word welcome to that number, 877-933-2484. Um, so, yeah, several things happening today all at once. So let's bring the mind of Christ to bear on some of these headlines. There is a jury uh, being seated in the New York criminal trial of Donald Trump on charges that he falsified business documents in an attempt to obscure payments made through his attorney to women he hoped would then not reveal extramarital affairs. Um, all kinds of uh, conversations that you could have here um, on this topic. We talked about a few yesterday, and that is, you know, how, how impartial um, could you be? And what does it mean to sit in judgment of another person? 
But today, um, I want I want you to consider a couple of different angles to this story as well. Um, at issue here is an individual, for sure. Um, I mean, there is one individual on trial. But I want you to think if you've ever had um, somebody in your life facing criminal uh, prosecution, then you know that these trials are trying for the entire family. So would you pray today for um, Melania? And would you pray today for Barron? You know, citizen Trump, President Trump, is also someone's husband and someone's dad. He's a grandpa. Um, there are other people who are experiencing this trial in ways that you and I are not experiencing this trial. And trials are trying. It's in the name. And so, uh, you know, on one level, it might be trying your patience or it might be, you know, trying you in, in some particular way. But it's trying other individuals in other ways. And I don't know about you, but um, it would be hurtful. It would be hurtful um, to have the kinds of things that are going to be exposed about uh, the practices of an individual. It would be really, really hurtful if that were your husband or your dad or your grandpa. And so I want you to just be mindful of that today as you are um, participating in conversations about the, the most high profile thing that's ever happened in terms of a president of the United States. Um, I also want you to celebrate and think about courthouse ministries today. Some of the most vibrant ministries out there happen um, at the courthouse steps. Like, you know, there's, there's hospital um, ministry and emergency room ministry, and there's courthouse ministry. And man, those are really critically important um, places and spaces to be reaching out uh, to one another. There's another historic trial taking place today in Washington, D.C. Um, House Republicans delivered articles of impeachment yesterday against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Um, they walked them over to the Senate. And um, so today, uh, I expect it to be a very brief trial in the upper chamber of the Senate. Um, might even conclude today. It might be over almost before it starts. Um, but I think that it is an opportunity for us to talk about not only the brokenness of our U.S. immigration system and our need as Christians to, um, to be Christians to people who arrive here however they come. Like once they're here, they're here. And so what does it mean to love those who are strangers among us? What does it mean to show hospitality to strangers as our biblical mandate? Like what, what does it mean as Christians to enter into this, um, not just the conversation as citizens of um, of the United States of America, uh, a small K kingdom, but what does it mean for us to be kingdom people, big K, um, you know, as people in desperate need arrive in our communities? And then um, maybe another way to to turn over the conversation or to till the soil of the conversation about the, uh, the articles of impeachment um, in relationship to Secretary Mayorkas, um, this is an opportunity to talk about how we're judged at work. Like, who's responsible um, and what are you responsible for? And who holds you accountable? It, it's difficult for uh, an individual to be held responsible in the context of work um, when the administration for whom they work sees particular uh, laws differently than um, than right now the members of Congress. This would be like uh, the board of directors of an organization having a different view of something uh, than your, the person you actually work for and you being held accountable um, for not doing something that the board said you should do when your immediate superior told you not to do it. Like it's complex. It's a mess. So I want you to think about what the word of God says in Colossians 3 verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, whatever you do, Work diligently or heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you are going to receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So no matter where you're working today, um, be reminded that ultimately each of us and all of us is doing work um, before 
and on behalf of Jesus Christ. We are working for the Lord, not for men. So let us honor God. Let's please God. Let's work diligently. Let's pray in humility. Let's, um, let's serve one another. And then recognize that the way we are held accountable in our day-to-day jobs may not line up with, um, what, with, with what we recognize is ultimately um, good and just. Like, it, it just may not. Um, the work in this world is toil since the days of the fall. All right, let's turn our attention um, to another headline um, in just a moment. Um, as Israel is weighing its options in terms of a military response to Iran's attack. But the United States of America has actually already responded, both in word and in deed. We'll pick that up next here on Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LaBurge, host of Mornings with Carmen. I love a good story, don't you? I love a good love story, a good mystery, a good travel log. I love a good turnaround story or a story that begins once upon a time and ends with happily ever after. So what's your story? Specifically, your Jesus story. What difference does Jesus make in your life? Could you tell it as a love story or a rescue story? However you tell it, trust me, we want to hear it. We love a good story. Connecting faith to life, Faith Radio. Hey, good morning again. I'm Carmen LaBerge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Uh, Sharon is, uh, like you, a listener. She's also a mom. She sent in a prayer request a um, few months ago now for her son, on behalf of her son. Um, he serves in the U.S. Air Force. He's a pilot. Um, her message then was, uh, my son's being uh, forward deployed to an Air Force base in Spain. Um, he is a part of a bomber task force. Uh, and so... Here's what I now know. Um, Sharon's son uh, was a part of the, is a part of the Howler 11 and 12 team. Part of the U.S. Air Force B-1 bomber program assigned to the 7th Bomb Wing at an Air Force base in Texas, forward deployed to Spain. But since the end of the month, um, they have been forward deployed to an Air Force base in Turkey. Now, so here's here's what I here's what I want you to recognize. Like you might have thought that the US Air Force sent these um B1 bombers, you know, it, it, to <clears throat> to Turkey, you know, right there on the border with Iran as some kind of like strategic message to Iran to hey, you know, pay attention, we're right here we're going to take care of our friends Israel, you know, don't uh, don't do anything stupid. Um God has known the calendar that other people, you know, think they're hatching in secret all the time. God's clearly known this calendar for a long time. He knows the end from the beginning. Um he knows the hearts of men, he knows what we're thinking, he knows what we're planning. Um and so as we've been praying for Sharon's son, as a member of the U.S. Air Force, you know, I got to tell you, I didn't know that I was praying because of all that would be happening in the Middle East and where that young man would be today. Um, But God knew. And so um, as you're weighing your options today in, in terms of prayer, just... Just recognize that, um, just be faithful in prayer. Just pray. Just lift up people and places and circumstances. And then just say, you know, with open hands and an open heart, God, you know. God, you know. All right. Um, Whatever's on the calendar today, (laughs) I want you to think back over over time and, you know, remember when you prayed for the things that you have today and remember when you prayed about the things that are happening today and then just recognize that, you know, God's timing is perfect. His ways are not our ways. His timing is not our timing, but his plans never fail. Um, So we make our plans. God determines our steps. Proverbs 16, 9 comes to mind. All right. uh, Another quick story here. Again, we're bringing the mind of Christ to bear on 
on things that are happening in the headline news. Uh, my hope is that you'll be equipped in these conversations, that uh, you'll have things to bring up today in conversation, or you'll be able to respond when people are talking about something. You'll be like, um, hey, wow, yes. I mean, yes, the United States has responded really magnificently in support of our friends in Israel. And and Sharon, who is also a listener to this show that I listen to in the morning, you know, her son's actually there, forward deployed. And so we've been praying for him. And um, how cool is that, that, you know, God knew, God knew that boy would be in this place on this day doing this thing. And um, and I'm just praying, you know, for his his protection and God's will be done in the region. And that'll be a great way for you to get God back into the conversation. Um, all right, coral reefs. Yeah, here's another headline for you. Coral reefs. Um, apparently, we are in the midst of the fourth global bleaching event. Did you even know we were having bleaching events? There you go. Since 1988. So high water temperatures are forcing corals to expel their colorful algae. It leaves them white and nutrient deprived. Um, and so, you know, they look like ghosts. Of course, even to say that something looks like a ghost is uh, is an interesting spiritual conversation. So there you go. The Holy Ghost, by the way, not a ghost but the spirit of the living God. So maybe don't call the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost, or if you do, then be ready to explain why he's not a ghost. Okay, Uh, I digress. Um, Death is a big deal, and the death of coral reefs is a big deal. Um, Coral reefs protect our coastlines from storm surges. Um, People visit to swim around and look at them. Um, And coral reefs support something like 25% of all marine life, all the life in the ocean. And so the death of a coral reef is a big deal. It's a living organism. And when it dies, it's a big deal because death is a big deal. Why? Because life is a gift from God and we can't make it. We can't make life. It's a gift from God. And we are held responsible as stewards of all of it. The, The creation mandate isn't just, you know, be fruitful and multiply. It is that we would um, be good stewards, good managers of all that God has set under um, under us. Our physical bodies would be, you know, first on that list. Um, the relationships we have. And then everything, everything that God has placed under your management. So, um, are there things around you that are turning ghostly? because they are nutrient-deprived, contaminated, and dying. When they're gone, what will be lost? How might you be an agent of of not only reconciliation, but an agent of resurrection hope today in the midst of whatever is dying around you? That very quickly brings to mind a friend who texted yesterday um, asking, for prayers for she and her husband and for their friends whose 21-year-old son took his life, took his own life, leaving behind a wife and brothers and parents and friends and questions and a wake of grief. In case nobody has told you yet today, you are precious and your life matters. God loves you. God sees you. God knows what you're dealing with. God can make a way where there seems to be no way. Seems like a good time to just remind everybody that um, there's a resource called 988. If you are at a place where you think there is no hope left and you are considering doing something that cannot be undone, just call 988 on your phone. Don't take your own life into your own hands because your life belongs in God's hands. We belong to God in life and in death. On the subject of life, let me quickly uh, point out this. Um, Have you heard that there's this new trend at gender reveal parties? First of all, did you even know that there are gender reveal parties now? Like at a certain point in pregnancy, um, when 
you know, when the mom and the dad are ready to tell everybody, you know, that it's going to be a boy or a girl. Maybe you're remembering the days where you had to wait until the baby was born and they were like, it's a girl, it's a boy. Right. So exciting. So wonderful. Some people are still waiting um, and they're not finding out in advance. Other people are making a big to do of of letting everybody know that it's going to be a boy or it's going to be a girl. Actually, that it is a boy or it is a girl. Um, that that's on the way that God is knitting together. Well, there's a new trend um, where they're doing live ultrasounds at gender reveal parties. Uh, there are these mobile 4D ultrasounds making it possible for people to actually see the baby in the womb. And, you know, if you see a fully formed baby in the womb, um, it doesn't take very long to guess if it's a boy or it's a girl. So there you go. And your first reaction to this may be that it's unnecessary, that it's silly, that, you know, it's just people coming up with one more reason to have a party that focuses on them, whatever. So you may think it's totally over the top, but let me give you another perspective. As these videos of these 4D ultrasounds, these um, live gender reveal parties, as they garner tens of millions of views on TikTok and Instagram and other social media platforms, let me tell you this. It is impossible. It is impossible to not see a baby. You see a real live baby in the womb. When you look at a 4D ultrasound image, you see a fully formed human being looking back at you. You see their hands and their feet. You see their eyes. You see their nose. You see all the parts of their body being knit together. You see that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. God is giving us a window into the miracle of what is happening in the womb of a woman. So I view this as a tremendously incredible pro-life opportunity for us to allow people to see what is happening, what God is doing in the womb of a woman when a human life is being formed. So as silly as you may find it and as ridiculous as you may think it is to have a gender reveal party with a live ultrasound, Let me tell you, God is getting his glory and changing hearts and minds by having tens of millions of people watch these videos and seeing, hey, that really is a baby. How are our moral views formed? How do we learn the difference between right and wrong? How do we learn to choose right over wrong, not just sometimes, but every time and everywhere? How do we actually become moral agents and make moral choices with real freedom? I mean, if I raised a child and taught them to lie and I taught them to cheat and I taught them to steal, you would not consider me a very good parent. So how do we help one another develop moral clarity in um, in a world where lying and cheating and stealing have become the order of the day? We're going to talk with Dr. Corbin Hornbeek next. He's the president of the University of Northwestern St. Paul and Northwestern Media. Um, We're going to talk about moral clarity uh, as one strategy for a gospel-empowered engagement with culture. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Oh, yes. You can send me your baby pictures on the text line, including those ultrasound pictures. And let me tell you, I have uh, I have one on a little stand in my dining room right now, a little ultrasound picture of little Liam, who's due to arrive in August, already praying for him, um, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, praying for that baby from top to bottom, also praying for little Rosemary, who's due to arrive in June. I don't just want to know the gender. I want to know their name so I can pray for them by name from head to toe. Uh, so uh, who who you got cooking out there? Uh, what are they? What are we calling them? Um, I want to be praying with you as um, God brings more and more life into the world. So you can send me those on the text line 877-933-2484. Dr. Corbin Hornbeek is here with us. He's the president uh, of the University of Northwestern St. Paul and Northwestern Media, so my big boss. Um, but he's also a dad who I bet saw ultrasound pictures of his kids once upon a time. <laughs> good morning, Carmen. Uh, so good, good to be morning. with you uh, with you both this morning. And uh, yeah, but, you know, when our, our kids are in their 20s, so... 
uh, you know, we got the one D, <laughs> that little that little outline, and you're like, oh, I think I can see a person there. Um, yeah, we're now we're you know we would love to have some grandchildren. We don't we don't have none of our kids are married yet. So you know it's like let's get some kids married here and and get us some grandchildren, go. please. Okay, well, so um, you have raised them to be moral agents. Let's yeah. talk about moral agency. Because that, I think a, a conversation about morality or moral agency yeah. leads us to a conversation about moral clarity. And that's mm. a part of your four strategies that you're yep. sharing with us for gospel-empowered cultural engagement. So we've talked a little bit about theological certainty. Let's talk today about moral clarity. Right. What, what is what is moral or morality? You know, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, it begins with um, our created identity by our creator. It begins with this um, biblical concept that is in the first pages of Scripture that we are created in the image of God. And, you know, we we wonder, well, what does that mean to be created in the image of God? Is that a physical image? Um, what does that mean? But a key part of the image of God is um, this idea that, that God is a moral God, and he imprinted on our lives, on our very being, uh, his sense of morality. And Paul talks about that uh, in Romans uh, chapter 2. In fact, he, uh, Paul talks about the Gentiles, meaning non-believers. But he says this. He says, indeed, when Gentiles, in other words, non-believers, who do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law, their law for themselves. So what, in other words, what Paul is saying is um, you don't have to be a Christian, or in this case, Paul was referring to the Jews, um, who have this, you know, this written code, this written law. Um, every single person is born with a moral code written on their hearts, and that's given to us by God. So it begins with that. All right. So I think you're talking there about, you know, the power of conscience. Um, yeah. And that is that is formed um, somehow over time. I mean, we are we are born um, as moral agents, yeah. uh, as image bearers of the living God. And then we are shaped and formed and sometimes deformed mm-hmm. by uh, the the situations we find ourselves in as little children um, who grow up uh, in particular environments and we're exposed to certain ideas. And so that's why we need a transformation. Yep. Like uh, we do need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds because all of us are deformed along the way in terms <laughs> yeah. of our uh, yeah. in terms of morality. Yeah. And we live with these two realities side by side. We have this you know, sense of moral um, conscience, moral um, that uh, our moral being is part of the image of God, but we are also fallen. And on the you know early pages of of the book of Genesis, we deal with both of these things that we were created in the image of God and then the fall of humanity. And so these things that Paul talks very clearly live in conflict with each other, um, both internally in our lives. There is this fall of humanity, fall of man, fall of woman, fall of uh, humanity that pulls us away from that um, that imprint, that moral uh, imprint that God's put on our lives. And then, of course, we live in a broader culture uh, that has a, um, I think we would all say in today's world, uh, we live in an increasingly secular culture, a, a culture that is increasingly um, absent of a worldview that includes a sense of immu- immutable morality or transcendent morality that comes from somewhere other than ourselves. And so, um, in that kind of a, a culture and a world in which we live, there is this sense of moral drift. And um, everybody, in fact, I've heard the phrase being used often uh, lately, uh, speak your truth, something like that, which is your truth, my truth, you know, his truth, her truth. There isn't any absolute truth. And how do you form a sense of moral conscience or uh, or? Uh, absolute morality when everybody gets to pick and choose their truth. So that leads us to a conversation, I think, about moral relativism, right? I mean, that's that's where that... Yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about moral relativism versus um, an immutable or transcendent morality. Yeah. One, one comes from God, like God is the one who is defining true right and true wrong 
um, true good and true evil. That's the immutable transcendent morality. Yep. I am going to, um, I am going to live in these ways because these are mm. right, righteous, you know, true truth versus moral relativism where, you know, I, I'm the captain of my own ship. I'm the master of my own destiny. I make my own rules along the way. Um, and so do you. And what a morass we end up in if moral relativism is the way that the majority of people go. It is, um, <clears throat> uh, it's a road that leads nowhere. Um, and it feels, you know, it's offered to us in a sense, a package to us uh, as freedom. You are a free person. You're free to live however you want. But, of course, we know that that leads to, um, you know, social chaos uh, at every level. And so we, we're grappling with this uh, reality of living in a world where um, we're more and more reluctant uh, as a culture and society to claim a transcendent moral truth. Um, but I will go back to my own, you know, my own faith conversion um, because I was really far from God uh, my freshman year in college. And what really convinced me that there had to be a God in this world, Carmen, was the fact that I couldn't explain why I did the things I did and felt so guilty about it. Where did that come from? <laughs> was that just a social construct? Um, and if so, um, well, wh how might I dispel the social construct and then just go on doing what I do and feel okay about it? I couldn't do that. I had to confront the fact that there were certain things in my life that I I knew were wrong and they didn't come from anywhere else other than the fact that I knew that they were wrong. That was what pointed me to the idea of a transcendent moral God. Um, as we, you know, as we look at the idea of, of, of moral clarity, uh, and maybe we can talk about that for a moment, because, you know, what has shaped my, my thinking around this is the leader, the person Daniel uh, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, who had such a strong he had such a strong anchor, and yet he served pagan kings, and he was able to live in both of those worlds. And so developing a sense of moral clarity and moral conviction doesn't remove us from the world. It actually places us right, right in the center of some of the hardest places uh, for us to live and lead in the world today. That's so good. Let's continue um, in just a moment talking about Daniel as a good model here as we seek to um, find our footing or, or refine our footing as moral um, agents, um, real moral agents in the reality of a world that is often very amoral. We are talking with Dr. Corbin Hornbeek. We will continue this conversation in just a moment. Where do you find moral clarity? What's at the What's at the center for you? Are there ways in which you know you're in moral rebellion? How might you make a moral recovery? Let's, uh, let's talk about Daniel as a good exemplar next. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. If you're a new listener, we want to officially welcome you with a free welcome pack gift. Request yours today at MyFaithRadio.com. How do you know the difference between right and wrong? Do you think you know the difference between <laughs> right and wrong? Um, do you make the choice of what is right and righteous every time? Sometimes? We're talking about moral clarity. We're talking about living as moral people, not in moral rebellion, um, but, uh, but righteously. Um, yeah. So we're talking with Dr. Corbin Hornbeek. He is the president of the University of Northwestern St. Paul. Um, and the president of Northwestern Media, of which Faith Radio is a part. And we're having an ongoing conversation with Corbin about these strategies for gospel-empowered cultural engagement. And we're looking at the life of Daniel from the Bible. Um, and on a prior occasion, we talked about theological certainty with humility. And today we're talking about moral clarity. So Corbin, um, why point to Daniel? What are some things about Daniel that you want to illuminate today? You know, the, the thing that that just grabs my attention about Daniel. Every time I read this story about Daniel is that he was a young boy who was taken into Babylonian captivity from Israel. 
um, a, a young boy, probably 12 or 13 years old. And somehow, and this is, you know, kind of the mystery of the book of Daniel, because it really doesn't tell us how, um, but we know that uh, Daniel was uh, uh, a young man who rose to the highest positions of leadership and influence in the Babylonian Empire, which is a godless, secular, pagan, uh, the worst of the worst uh, kind of uh, empire. And uh, I love in in Daniel 6 because, you know, he served four pagan kings. Um, People don't realize that often, but he served four different pagan kings, um, both the Babylonians and then the Persians. And um, I love this, how this says in in Daniel 6, so this is, you know, toward the end of his... uh, you know, sort of further on in his life. And there's an accusation that people are trying to get him. It's kind of the gotcha moment. And, uh, and they say this, um, the satraps who, you know, who are Persian, they say, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Uh, so somehow Daniel, from the time he was a young boy, taken into Babylonian captivity, rises to the highest levels of leadership, lived out a faithful life um, in adherence to his law, uh, the law of, uh, of, uh, of the Jewish Yahweh, God. So, you know, when we're talking about moral clarity, there's, there's two words sometimes we think of as the word conviction, um, and I'm using the word um, in particular clarity because they're a little bit different. And I think sometimes when you look at the life of Daniel, um, Daniel had to know what what was not up for grabs uh, in terms of his convictions. And then there were probably a whole lot of things that he had to be, I would say, um, flexible without um, compromising on and maybe we can talk about that a little bit because moral clarity allows us to to know what that foundation is that should never, ever change. Uh, certain things are always wrong, always wrong. Certain things uh, God gives us freedom to do that allows us to have uh, those places of influence in our culture. Mm. No, that's um, that's so – so that's a discernment issue. That's yeah. a knowing what, what God has um, said, right? So there's a biblical – literacy issue Mm -hmm. um, there. Um, And then there is a spirit at work within me um, obedience question. It's one thing to know what is right. It's another thing to do it. Yeah. You know, I I go back to um, the Apostle Paul um, because he was grappling with these issues as well in the New Testament church. And in the book of of First Corinthians, uh, of course, they're they're having all these kind of letters back and forth about issues, and the Corinthians kind of wanted Paul's opinion on certain things. And one of issues that arises is the issue of food sacrifice to idols, and and this has relevance to what we're talking about here because there were those in the early church that said, you know, that's been polluted. If and so the the food that's been sacrificed to pagan idols, you know, it's a little bit like you know, Daniel living in Babylon, um, what to do about food that's been polluted or sacrificed to idols. And of course, if you're Jewish, that would be a clear violation of the law. And so there's a question that says, you know, should we or should we not eat food that's been sacrificed to idols? And Paul kind of leaves it up for grabs a little bit. Um, And he says, be guided by your conscience on this. And I think this ties into the idea of moral clarity. Um, There are certain things that we should never do, but if we want to have influence in the world, there might be a time, Paul says, where you would eat food sacrificed to idols, but there also might be a moment in which you would choose not to. And if and and the guiding principle there, of course, is uh, might you violate somebody else's conscience and have that become an impediment to their experience in the grace of God? So ultimately, we don't want to make it about the thing. We want to make it about how do we how do we uh, live lives that are attractive to non-believers and be able to step into a culture that you know there is no right or wrong, and so we have to as Christians. Um, be convicted about what we know we must never, never do. There are certain things that are always wrong in every circumstance. And then there are times where God gives us freedom 
guided by discernment uh, and our conscience to be able to step into some of the hardest, uh, more secular places in the world. I think Daniel did this in a remarkable way. Um, how did how did he last through four pagan kings? <laughs> um, it's an incredible story. You know, the questions of the Pharisees um, to, to Jesus about, yeah. like, picking grain on the Sabbath, I right. think that those are the same kinds of conversations. Yep. And so— if we know what Scripture says and we have those stories um, from the Apostle Paul, from Jesus, from Peter about eat, you know, what, what we should eat and what we should drink, yep. um, what, what it looks like, what it really looks like yeah. to be a person in relationship with God and wanting God to be glorified and wanting people to be blessed, um, loving neighbor, loving God, loving neighbor, mm. um, being the you know, being the question that we're asking. But as soon as we do that, you know, we have to recognize that there are going to be people who define that, who Mm. want to define that in ways differently than God does. And so you do have to know where the limits are. You do have to know, you know, where the, you know, yeah, where where those strong boundaries are. And so thank you for that. Um, Mm. Because we don't want to step off to the right or to the left. but We also don't want to be people who fail to love because we are, are, are trying to live by a rigid list of rules instead exactly. of just allowing our hearts and minds to be ruled yeah. um, and governed by a sovereign God. That's so good. Corbin, mm. that's so good. Well, thank you. And I, it, Carmen, you just touched on it a moment ago. We we ultimately have to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, when we look at we look at the Old Testament law, the Jewish law, and what did Jesus do when he came and walked on this earth? Well, actually, he elevated it. Uh, so the Old Testament law says, you know, don't kill. And then Jesus said, look, if you have raka or anger in your heart, you've already done it. <laughs> you may have not committed the act, but you've committed the sin behind the act. And so Jesus raises the moral law, not so that we find ourselves trying to work harder and strive harder. But then he says, you need to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And the the law of the Spirit is ultimately the law of love. And the law of love is evidenced in our lives by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are the things that should guide us in our relationships with people. That's so good. Um, All right, we got to leave it right there. That's Dr. Corbin Hornbeek. You can find him at unwsp.edu. That's the University of Northwestern St. Paul. Um, I'm Carmen LaBurge. You've been listening to Mornings with Carmen here on the Faith Radio Network. I'll be praying for you today. Uh, You'll be praying for me. Um, as you get out there into the world that God so loves, let me encourage you to do so in ways that honor Jesus. Be a living demonstration of the King and the kingdom in the midst of the kingdoms of this world. Whatever today holds, recognize that God holds you in the midst of this day, in the very palm of his hand. Um, So may you find yourself also at the center of his will. Have a great day and God bless. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.